Let's give a shout of praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless his name. Praise the Lord. It's a great sight. I am so excited to uh, see you all here. You may be seated. Can I uh, just say that it's so great to have the Church of Rapid City gathering together. We, God spoke to me seven years ago and said, invite pastors to come and pray together. And um, a year later, I did that. <laughs> that's, that's the man of faith I am right there. So, uh, so I invited pastors to come and, and uh, we had three to start with and we began to pray together. And uh, over, the, over the next six years, We've, uh, we've prayed together, we've, uh, we've opened it up, we've had other people who've come and just people that are prayer warriors and, uh, and faith leaders who've come and, and prayed together every Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. And during that time, God, we've just, we've, our, our, our mission is to pray over our city. That was, that, was the, that was the deal. We're not there to pray over each other, although that happens, but our, but our mission was to pray over our city. The, um, the understanding is this. We are spiritual leaders of our city, and we have authority to pray over our city. In the same way that the mayor and the city council of our city make decisions about our city and have authority, we have authority over our city. And so we come together to pray effectively. We, we always pray, Lord, help us to be effective in our prayers. Holy Spirit, lead us, reveal things to us. Help us to see things that others cannot see. Help us to, in our spirit to know how to push back the darkness over our city. And in the process of that, we began to claim that this city belongs to Jesus. And we began to say that 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 this city is not like every other city. We're claiming this city for Jesus. And so, so what, we believe, what we believe in that is that the spiritual atmosphere of our city will begin to raise and raise and raise and the, will push back the darkness. And so one of the things that I feel strongly about is as we gather together over these next tonight and these next uh, four times that we meet together is that is that there is authority as the church unifies and we pray over our city i love this city and i want to see god direct this city i want to see i want to see our, our i'm so thankful i believe with all my heart that one of the reasons we have a godly christian mayor is because we've been praying for a godly christian mayor I believe the president of our school board is Bishop Troy Carr. I don't believe that's an accident. That's because we've been praying over our school board. And our group is not the only people that are praying. There are other people that are praying. But I believe that, that as we begin to gather together, it took time for pastors to trust one another. There's, there's always, when you get churches and you get pastors, there's always kind of that spirit of territorialism. And we had to break that. You have to break that. You have to pray against that, that we love one another, that we trust one another. And so um, we've developed that over time. And so we pray for, together, we pray for one another, we pray with one another over this city. And so I'm just asking you to begin to join us. I ask you to begin to understand what this is all about. Because I've had lots, lots of people say, what is this about with the city belongs to Jesus? This is about capturing our city for Jesus Christ. This is about pushing back the darkness. This is about seeing a city transformed by the power of Almighty God. And so I ask you to join us in that. We're going to have times of prayer tonight. 
And uh, those times of prayer, I believe, are going to be powerful and effective in the heavenly realms. Okay? So, are you, are you with that? Yeah. Are you with that? Give the Lord praise tonight. Thank you. Wagner, and I'm a part of this church, and I'm also the state coordinator for National Day of Prayer. And the reason I brought my phone up here is because I have to have a timer. As you know what happens when you turn an intercessor loose. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of direction for what we're going to do in the next 10 minutes. So for some of you, this is going to be old hat, very familiar. For some of you, it may be the first time you've ever tried this, and you're going to be scared, but it's going to be okay. Um, it is a good way to get a lot of prayers before the throne of Jesus in a very short period of time. So when I give you a prompt, you're all going to pray at the same time. Now, you can pray silently if you need to. That's fine. But I hope most of you will pray out loud, and it will make a really big noise for the Lord. And if you're like me, you're probably going to have to plug your ears because you're going to get wrapped up in the person next to you. So we're all going to be praying at once, all at the same time, out loud for about a minute and a half. So we're going to be, for this set, we're going to be praying for families, for the church, for government and education. And I'm going to say a, a brief prayer of praise and uh, repentance before we go. Father, we bow before you in adoration. You are the creator and the sustainer of life. You are the God who sees us and who saves us. Your word tells us if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, tonight we confess before you that we are a sinful and prideful people. And we ask you to make us presentable to cry out to you in the name of Jesus. Pray now for families. Father, I pray that you would bring families closer to you by prompting them to pray, study scripture, serve actively in church, and love neighbors together. We pray the Holy Spirit will fill our hearts and our homes, binding us together in love, honor, joy, and trust in Jesus' name. Now we're going to be praying for the church. Go.
Oh God, may we sanctify you, Lord God, in our hearts and be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for the reason of our hope. We declare that we are your hands and feet on earth. May the church in Rapid City walk worthy of our calling with lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, and bearing with one another in love, enduring to keep a unity of spirit in Jesus' name. And now we will pray for government for our city, state, and nation. Whatever is on your heart, pray. Father, we ask for your wisdom for leaders here in Rapid City and the Black Hills region. We pray first for their salvation, belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that they would trust in the Lord with all their heart and lean not on their own understanding and that they would acknowledge you in all their ways. We pray that they would seek your face that they would seek your heart and that they would seek your hand in all that they do. Lead them, Lord, as they lead our city, our state, and our nation. May our laws reflect our loyalty and love to you and your ways, and may your justice flow from our courts. In Jesus' name. And now we will pray for education. Pray now. O oh, Father of all truth, we lift up education in our city and in our land. We pray for those who make critical decisions, those who teach, those who learn, those who serve and support in every area of education in Rapid City and beyond.
And God, I just praise you for what our legislature did today in approving a bill that will stop any lewd behavior on our campuses. We praise you, God, and we pray that you would protect all campuses from violence and wickedness, making campuses a safe place to learn and prepare students to thrive. Lord Jesus, release your Holy Spirit into every campus in our community. Speak and engage our youth that they would lead an awakening and revival an awakening and revival that would be so contagious that the whole city and surrounding Black Hills will be transformed into the city that truly belongs to Jesus. Father, we wrap these prayers in a bundle and place them at your feet. Lord Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, Nothing like hearing the church pray. All right. The Church United. The Pentagon. It was created to unify the armed forces. Even though the Army stays the Army, Navy stays the Navy Air Force, stays the Air Force, Marines stay the Air Force, the Pentagon is ground zero. And it was created so that they could communicate. The Pentagon was... uh, the only place where they decided they'd be able to win the war, that they would be able to see each other eye to eye and decide how do we together take this? How do we take on the enemy? And uh, accordingly, the Pentagon is where the enemy points all of its big guns. Uh, Accordingly, it should come as no surprise to us that the enemy has targeted the unity of the church of Jesus from the very beginning. You know, uh, the church has a history of not getting along. And uh, we could see it in the pages of the New Testament from the very beginning. Christians took sides, questioning one another's motives and integrity. Catch this. In the ninth chapter of Mark's gospel, verse 38, it says, John said to Jesus, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. Exactly. Uh, The disciples saw a work being done in the name of Jesus by somebody that wasn't part of their group. And right away, the guy was held suspect. And not only that, he's reprimanded for serving Jesus. And it's not that the guy in this verse was doing something wrong in the name of Jesus. Actually, he was doing something right. And apparently the guy was able to uh, cast demons out of people. Uh, What's strange is that earlier in the very same chapter in verse 18, all 12 of the disciples are unable to cast out one demon from a boy. So the disciples can't, but this stranger can, and the disciples don't see it as a good thing. All they see is that he's not part of their group, so something must be wrong. Uh, Can we read a bit of jealousy into their reaction? At verse 39, Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is is for us. That's the context of that statement that we all know. So Jesus is telling the disciples that the man is not an enemy, he's an ally. And I would say it is arrogance that we ever see other Christians as our enemy. Or our competition. I mean, that's nothing more than sibling rivalry. We're all adopted. Anybody born a Christian? For the last uh, 30 years, um, I've watched, I'll simply say, a global movement of God in our time. And that has been the breaking down of denominational and racial walls that have divided the church in America for centuries, right? Okay, and in, uh, in melting his church into one church, I, I'm, I've been watching churches worshiping together, pastors of all different denominations, and praying together, churches of different affiliations, serving communities together, reaching the lost together, and it's incredible. 
Now, the vast majority of churches aren't doing it, but we've got more doing it than we had doing it 30 years ago. Uh, when I pastored in uh, a church in Maui, Hawaii, you know where all the fires took place in Lahaina? Uh, so the church I pastored, about half of the members of that church lost everything in those fires. But uh, I met every Tuesday morning with five of the pastors there in Lahaina, and we prayed. And um, we, we were all youth pastors prior to being pastors of churches. And, uh, and we were all raised in churches and went to youth groups uh, when we were kids. And we were reflecting on what that was like. And uh, we talked about how it used to be taboo to speak to the members of other churches because we were told they didn't interpret the Bible correctly or they held strange beliefs or they were arrogant and stuffy and all that kind of thing. But things are changing because God is working. And Christians are now more likely to describe themselves as Christians instead of Lutherans, Methodists, Independent, and all that. It's kind of nice. Um, it was in uh, 96 that I went with my brother, who's a pastor, and my dad, who's a pastor. We w went to um, Promise Keepers Clergy Conference in Atlanta, in the Georgia Dome. 40,000 pastors were there. First time in the history of the church. 40,000 pastors in one place. Uh, at the time, there was 400,000 churches in America. So 40,000, uh, we saw that as 10%. We saw that as a tithe. <laughs> and, and it was telling God, we're serious about finally getting together. And, and we watched two huge giants fall. And it was the, the giants of denominal, denomination, denominations. And, 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 and racism. Yeah. And um, <laughs> Max Luke, you know Max Lucado. Uh, he, he spoke and he just painted a wonderful picture as, as he does with words of, of how we're all different, how the de different denominations. And, and I'll just say, by the time he was done, we were also convicted of the things we used to say about other pastors and other denominations that he said, you know, now it's time to get right with each other. And, and, and it was wild what happened. I mean, you'd hear all across the stadium, you know, a Presbyterian would yell out, is there a Baptist? Is there a Baptist? One would say, I'm a Baptist. And then they'd be crying on each other's shoulder. And we'd see all these pastors start to do this. Same thing happened when we dealt with racism. You know, racism uh, is not a social problem. It's not an economic problem. It's a spiritual problem. Because it's a sin problem. God loves variety and made people in variety. The problem is we don't like it. So God was dealing with that too. Oh, and we saw pastors crying on each other's shoulders. In fact, some people cried so much, uh, they were getting de de dehydrated. I kid you not. I kid you not. Did you know you can cry that, that hard? You can de be, be dehydrated? Um, hmm. You know, on the night, the last night of Jesus' life, before he went to the cross, you know, he didn't pray for the health of his disciples. You, you know what he prayed for? Their unity. Did you catch that? John 17, verse 20. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one. one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you. Well, think about that. What kind of oneness is he praying for? May they be in us. I haven't felt that yet. I haven't arrived there yet. How about you? How about the church? As Jesus says, as you, Father, are in me and just like I'm in you, may they be like that with us and with each other. Oh, how about that? So that the world may believe that you sent me. I want to give you uh, an example of why our unity is so important. Some years ago, I had a significant conversation with a guy who was Jewish. Uh, he was about to marry a woman who was Buddhist. Um, and we were talking about different faiths, and I shared my conviction that there's one overriding truth in the person and in the work of Jesus. And he countered and he said, but there's so many choices for the outsider, they can't decide what to go to, so they decide to stay outside. He said that they might start.
start to seek out one church who warns them to stay away from the one down the street, which is also a Christian church, but a different denomination. And he said, quote, unquote, it's an embarrassment to your riches. So he was saying that we got so much, we have so much variety that we should work, it should work in our favor to reach the variety of outsiders, but instead we hold each other in contempt. So our variety uh, has become our hangup, hasn't it? We name our churches on, uh, not on our founder, but let's say on things like our form of government, Presbyterian, or our style, Methodist, uh, or our founding theologian, Lutheran, or some image that we want to put forth like you know, new life community. While it's the Mormons, that they have the same church name on, on every one of their buildings. No wonder the outsider's confused. The outsider's confused because the insider's confused. We, the insiders, we easily forget to whom the church belongs. And so nobody is more guilty of helping the insiders forget than pastors. Uh, if you remember in the wilderness, Satan tempted Jesus with empire building instead of kingdom building. And many pastors have been tempted with the same thing, empire building. Pastors and churches, they've been concerned with that. Their own audience, their own programs, their own facilities, instead of networking with other pastors and churches, attempting to reach a community together, claiming for it that's not there yet. They haven't arrived yet, but those who have arrived make, can make the claim. Rapid City is going to arrive. Amen. Rapid City will name the name of Jesus, right? And uh, churches have their differences. For various reasons, and that's just going to how it's going to be until Jesus returns. And so lines between churches are sometimes going to exist. But we make the mistake of building uh, walls on those lines. Yeah, that's right. Let's not do that. Uh, in a former state I was in, there was a church that had a reputation with other churches as being a little too far out on the one side of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but they had a program <laughs> that brought 6,000 people to Christ in two weeks. And the other churches, you want to know what they said about it? They said stuff like this. Well, I bet those decisions won't last. Uh, they probably use scare tactics to get them in. Uh, how do you know all those people were there? Uh, those were first time commitments. I mean, this is just like the story that we read, Mark. You know, uh, that there's this man who's successfully, enthusiastically serving Jesus and the other guys couldn't get excited about it. He's having success. These other folks are threatened. My gosh, when are we going to grow up? Amen. Competition between pastors and churches is from the pit. It is from the pit of hell. Yeah, that's right. Now, there, there's churches that um, give Jesus a bad name. Uh, but it's going to take wisdom and humility and the energy to explore any questions about what are perhaps questionable practices or beliefs of another church. And most often we're just content to label others as, um, as Max Lucado says, labeling is the ploy of a lazy mind. Labeling is the ploy of a lazy mind. You know, could it be that the great sin of the world is not the media, but the disunity of the church? Revelation chapter 7, verse 7, uh, chapter 7, uh, starting at verse 9. It's where we can see what the apostle John saw in heaven. Ah, <laughs> After this, I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from every tribe and people and language standing before the throne and before the lamb robed in white with palm branches in their hands and they cried in a loud voice saying salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the lamb now <laughs> did you catch this you know what I really like about this what John saw is that we keep our God given variety John clearly was able to differentiate between the races. He saw members of every single race in heaven. Uh, is that a surprise? He saw the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Jesus told the disciples to go and make disciples of what? All nations. All nations. So if there's no racism in, in, in heaven, there should be no racism in the church. 
Because the church is supposed to be heaven on earth. supposed to be the unity of the church is mandatory for our impact and our survival in the days ahead i don't know where you're at I, i'm going to guess you're an educated bunch you, you seek the lord you pray and you know that um, things are kind of looking like what the bible said they'd start to look like as jesus's return comes near we got to get it together time to get unified once and for all, and not temporarily, permanently. We got to work together, one team, one body, one bride, one church. Let's make our Savior proud. Amen. Amen. Bishop Troy. Good evening, everyone. As said, I'm Bishop Troy Carr. I'm pastor of Faith Temple Church, and I'm the president of the school board. James 5 and 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And I stand as evidence of the power of prayer. In two and a half years, I went from being asked to be a member of the board to being the first vice president of the board to being president of the board. And that's not because of me not because of my wisdom, not because of my good looks, but it's because of prayers. Because seven years ago, somebody said yes to getting pastors together and, and praying. And so this is the result. So if you, if you are wondering if prayer works, prayer does work. The format of our, our next 10 minutes will be, we'll have... Um, at least four of us, one of us that was going to pray had to go pick up a child. Um, but we're going to be praying for the areas of business, military, media, medical, and poverty. And I ask that each, as each person comes and begins to lead prayer, that we all um, quietly and in unison pray um, with and um, support whatever the leader of that particular prayer is is saying and then when that person is done then the next person will come so the first person that's coming is Gordon Howie Father God we're here tonight because there's darkness around us and we came tonight to repel the darkness and Lord we intend to do it by invoking your name your power and your presence so right now in the name of Jesus God we look over this city as you look over it and you walk to and fro through the alleys through God through the bike path through the under the bridges God and you see those who are steeped in bondage Lord they're sleeping on the streets they're killing one another God they're living in poverty in disease and wickedness God because the evil one has a grip on them and tonight in the name of Jesus Lord you said whatever we ask in the name of Jesus whatever we ask you you would do and so we're asking you to dispatch your warring angels post them underneath the bridges post them God behind every building in every alley in the name of Jesus God we're asking you to send those warring angels to to deliver from addiction, to deliver from bondage, to deliver from hatred, from racism, from disease. And God, by your power and your spirit, speak to each one. 
and bring them to the foot of the cross. Lord, because when we speak to the darkness, you've told us that it will flee. You said, resist the devil and he will flee. So tonight we resist the devil and all of his demon forces by the power and authority in the most high king of kings in the name of Jesus. And by his shed blood, we cover this city with righteousness. We call it righteous city. We call it delivered. We call it healed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, right now we pray for the arts and our social media. Father, I thank you for our God-given talent to express your love through arts and drama. God, I thank you for the social media world that is a way to take your word to the nations. Father, I bind the enemy of our soul, the prince of the air, who will try to pervert what we see and what we hear. We bind Satan and the subtleness of witchcraft in the name of Jesus that will try to sneak its sway in our viewing. We bind the spirit of perversion. We bind predators that prey on the young, the women, the men. God, in the name of Jesus, we bind those who will try to scam. God, in Jesus' name, we take authority over the airways. God, we take authority over the arts for your glory Lord in the name of Jesus we take this city for your kingdom God we thank you for giving us the imagination the idea the vision to birth something great for your kingdom God we thank you for laughter that comes through arts for we know that laughter is good like medicine God we thank you for music that soothes our souls God we thank you for the joy and the renewed hope we feel when you minister God God, when the minstrels play under the anointing of God. Father, we need your anointing that destroys the yoke to be upon our lives as we stroll through the social media. God, God, our eyes and our hearts in the name of Jesus. Father, even limited our usage, God. God, let us not distance from reality, from our families, even from you because we're strolling, God. In the name of Jesus, help us to know when enough is enough. God, help our children who are unsupervised with social media. God, protect their spirits. Lord, protect their minds. God, God, their souls in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the mindset of the godly producers, the directors, the actors. God, that put out Christian media. Christian art, movies to spread your word, your love, and your forgiveness. God, we thank you that we can take your word to the world for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Bless your holy name, Lord God. We come to you, Lord God. I'm praying for medical in the name of Jesus. And I speak Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from sin. Depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, with your word, Lord God, we lift it up to you and we trust in you, Father, not in ourselves, but in you, Father God, that you have all of us in our health in mind, our physical, emotional, and spiritual health, Lord God. We lift up to you all of the clinics and hospitals, Lord God, who are providing care for every person who needs it, Lord God. We ask that you will provide the care for everyone, that everyone deserves health care, Lord God, and that you have sound mind and body people willing and able who will provide that care, Lord God. And I pray for the professionals, Lord God, every single person who works in the health field, Lord God, that you will provide what is enough for them, Lord God, to provide for them, Lord God, that you give them spiritual well-being, that you give them a good sound mind and body in all that they do, Lord God, that they can trust in you, that you will put them a armor of protection around each and every one of them, Lord God, that we will do no harm. 
in Jesus' holy name, that everyone is treated with respect and love that will glorify you, Father. In Jesus' holy and precious name, we lift it up to you. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, we pray for our military. We start by praying for our commander in chief. God, in many of our eyes, he's going in the wrong direction, but you can turn him around. You even have the power to save. You even have the power to correct. So God, even if he doesn't have a changed mind, God, put people around him that would speak righteousness, that would speak holiness as he makes decisions about our military. God, we pray for our servicemen and women who are currently in uh, areas of war, that you would protect them, that you would keep them safe, that you would remind them that they are not not alone, God, that you would be with them in their time of need. God, and we pray against the effects of war, the PTSD that our servicemen and women come from and the suicidal rate that is that is unheard of and un, uh, that is too high for, for our liking, God. We pray for depression and all the other things that come with being in the military and seeing things of war. God, you're a God that can heal, so we ask that you would heal the minds, that you would heal the bodies, that you would heal the spirits of all our service men and women that are in the military. God, we pray against the spirit of divorce that is running rampant when a husband and wives are away from each other. God, I ask that you would keep the marriages, that you would protect the marriages. God, that you would protect the spouses as they're away from loneliness. God, I pray for the commanders of F. Ellsworth Air Force Base. I pray for the commander of the South Dakota National Guard. I pray for the commander of our veteran affairs in our area, God. I pray for these leaders, God, in the name of Jesus, that you would speak to them. God, I'm not quite sure that you're, their relationship with you, but if they don't have a relationship, God, I pray that they come into right standing and have a relationship with you. And if they do have a relationship, I ask that you would strengthen them. I ask that you would help them make decisions that are according to your will. God, I pray for spouses of military members as their other spouse is away that as and they're taking care of the business and they're taking care of the children and they're lonely because their spouse is on the battlefield I ask that you would protect them God in Jesus name that you would be their strength that as the military and the church come uh, community will wrap their arms around them and be their help and be their keeper God I bless those who have chosen and volunteered to be in the military. They put their lives for us. The thought of death, they have volunteered and they are on the front line. So I ask that you would bless every military person who has volunteered to be a sacrifice so that we may be free, so that we can keep up the standards of our forefathers and keep up the standards of the constitution. I ask that you would give them a special blessing and a special honoring in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's clap our hands for Jesus. I would like to recognize all of the uh, pastors. So if all the pastors would stand, please, right now. And uh, we just want to say thank you so much for being here. I love and appreciate you so much. You, you mean so much that you supported this and, and uh, let people know to come and be here. Uh, I just feel so blessed to be able to see so many people here. And I just, uh, please share this with as many people as possible. I just believe that uh, we're just, it's just going to grow. I want to see us. Um, our goal is 1,500 people at the monument. And um, we can maybe blow that away. So it's my brother, Randy Phipps. Love you, Randy. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, Craig. Well, what a joy. What a joy it is to be here tonight. And uh, you know, it's not by accident. God's a God of order. God's a God of design and intention. He knows the plans he has for each of us. And uh, this has been a while in the making and a while to come. 
And I was there six years ago praying as an independent pastor with no association with denomination or even a congregation much at that time, saying, Lord, this is our city. This is where you have us planted. And we want to claim the city in Jesus' name. We've gone through a lot. I keep telling this, we're COVID survivors. One of the... Huh. Remember what a mess that was, guys? We're down there. We didn't even know if we could pray together, talk to each other. And I remember telling Scott, develop a relationship with him. And, and somewhere, he's way more politically oriented than I am. And he'll be the first to go to jail. So I always told him, I says, brother, I says, I, we'll either bail you out or break you out, whatever we got to do. <laughs> so, but I have other brothers and sisters in here that we, we look at that God is good so good all the time, isn't he? He's so good all the time. And uh, Patrick, did you get that little video up there? You got that? Would you just put that up, up there? I want you to watch this video. I worked really hard on this video. I think it's upside down, but you'll get the point. <laughs> Maybe it's sideways or whatever. But I was praying in preparation. And I thought of the things I want to say and what the Lord would have me say that it would be coordinated and I would obey him but as you see that picture that was the best attempt I could do to show you I don't have what I used to have I don't regret it and I used to be a sinner I used to be unsaved I used to be on my way to hell. And God changed that destiny. He changes that design. But sometimes also we would look and we'd say, some of these things we have in our hands, how quickly they diminish. We don't have long. And I'm getting in those elder years of my life. And I, 10 years ago, we started talking about well, maybe we should start a church, whatever, eight years ago, six years ago, five years ago, four years ago. And just, it, time just goes by so quickly. But when we started this thing about the city belongs to Jesus, there was no picture of the guy praying or anything. And, and it's, in, it's evolving. If I could use that, Christian evolution of, hey, this is what it is. Okay? Now, we kind of know where it's going to end up and what it's going to look like in heaven. But here on this earth, and, and recently we've added three words to the bottom of this city looks like Jesus, and they are pray, praise, and proclaim. So when everybody's asking, what does this look like? We'll say, well, we want pastors, we want people to pray together. We want them to praise together. And we want to proclaim God's word. God's word. To all who would have ears, to all who would hear. So my verse for this year and the verse for Midtown Church is this, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith. And a lot of times that's, you know, because the world's really trying to define and redefine and what's it mean to be a Christian and God's word and church. And, and there's a lot of confusion. Not here though, is there? You see, God's brought us clarity. He'll bring that clarity to us. He brought that clarity to a man named Moses. As he was challenged with a great task. And one of the first messages I ever publicly preached to adults. I was a children's pastor for quite a while. So there was a lot of messages that, that weren't well prepared or planned out. But the first one that was well prepared and planned out. <laughs> yeah. Was this message though about what do you have in your hand? Exodus 4 2, the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And we know it's familiar, it was a staff. But I want us to look tonight, what's what's in our hands? Because it's who we are, where we're at, with what we have. And that's what God's gonna use. And a lot of people they would wait, you know how many guys are waiting on I'm just waiting on the Lord. Just waiting on the Lord. Well, he's waiting on you to act in faith to have a victory. Now, I don't know what that victory is that you're looking for, but I know that the victory is that God's looking for, and it always involves souls. 
Salvation. Repentance. Renewing. Rededication. So when we look at it, it's always involving people. Ephesians 3, 7 and 12 says this. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I emphasize verse 9 and 10 here. And to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church... Where did the church come from? Is this man's idea? Was it, did, I didn't, you know, looking at the latest, greatest things, you know, businesses to develop and franchises to get into. I missed out on, I ain't missed out on nothing. <laughs> but it was God's design to create the church so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Our faith in him is what brings the victory. So when we're looking and we're feeling defeated, like, oh, I missed that opportunity. God restores God brings resources. God brings people to put them across your path. Now, sometimes you'd be thinking that, oh, wait a minute. I don't have anything. And that's, a, that's a lie from the pit of hell. That's a lie. You got, you got everything. Boldness, access, confidence through our faith in him. So the manifold wisdom of God, according to Bible commentators, the manifold wisdom of God is a poetic and artistic expression suggesting the intricate nature of an embroidered pattern as in Joseph's tunic of many colors. Or, or as this says, each member of the body of Christ manifests a different aspect of God's image. And together, believers form a perfect blend of harmony and diversity. The many features, forms, and colors of fellowship in the church reflect the manifold wisdom of God. And we need to proclaim that, that we're his representatives. We've been empowered with truth. We've been empowered with the Holy Spirit to be able to go into this world and teach those that would have ears to hear. And as I was saying earlier, talking about this is the victory that we find through our faith because we're faithful to the word of God. And we are faithful to the God of the word. As we pray, as we praise, and as we proclaim. Now when the church fails, we look like the world. We think like the world. We talk like the world, we dress like the world, we act like the world, and then we embrace the values of the world. Or we get unbiblical. And we got to call back to God. We got to call back to faith. We got to call back to his word that we would have victory because of our faith. And that faithfulness then leads us to responsibility. That's why so people have faith. Because it does require a degree of work. And that requires responsibility. And there's been so many people who have abdicated responsibility. God given responsibility. It's like they had the responsibility right there. And it just melted away. So we have a responsibility to tell and talk about the gospel. The good news. To whoever would have ears to hear, wherever you're at. Don't be limited. Don't be restricted. Don't be saying, oh, I can't talk about that. This is work. This is a restaurant. This is a football game. Tell them talk. How about teach and train? Finding somebody to say, I love you so much. 
I, I can't just ignore you or let you try and figure it out of your own devices because then the enemy is going to grab a hold of them. They're going to be fooled. They're going to be deceived. They're going to fall into, well, I was in that pit. And I, I'm so glad that this hand saw the hand of God. The hand of God was extended. Yeah. The hand of discipleship was extended. The hand of redemption was extended. So as we continue, let's invite people to come pray. Let's invite people to come praise. Let's invite people to come. Now, I'll be the first to tell you. Here they put us up on a music stand. We need more pulpits in our country. We need more pulpits in our community. We need more preaching and proclaiming of the word of God in our community. And I'll leave you with this last verse out of Galatians 6 and 10. It says, so then, as we have opportunity, look at your hand. This is one of the greatest gifts, opportunity. Let us do good to everyone, everyone, and especially those who are of the household of faith. Amen. 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 Thank you.